on the broad spectrum of hardware and software. And finally, we'll talk about some of the technical challenges that the team faces and how we solve them on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, uh, that's the quick story. But what you guys are do doing uh, here is the most difficult thing to do on a sunny day, sitting inside in Seattle. That <laughs> rarely happens. So thank you. Uh, so, so if you look at the uh, history of productivity, you know, in olden times, thousands of years back, people had to walk thousands of miles to deliver a message. Then advent of writing comes in. We write, hang letters to pigeons and send them and uh, deliver the message. And that leaves behind people time to do other stuff. That makes people's life productive. And then Henry Gutenberg invents the printing press. It's easy to communicate farther around the world. And then finally, with the advent of internet and the digital revolution, we are able to send messages at an instant around the world. But one thing that remains constant is the power of writing. Writing is something so powerful, so personal. Uh, it, it is an embodiment of your personality. You want to write when you sign your page. We, we still sign our pages. We still sign when we pay, make payments on our credit card because it's something so fundamentally close to defining our identity. So we think writing is not going to go away anywhere. The forms of writing will change. How we capture data, how we communicate in the digital world will change. But the idea of writing is going to stay. And our intent is to make sure we take that and uh, make it so powerful that it becomes natural writing in the digital age. Uh, if uh, Surface's uh, uh, vision is to be the most productive planet on the Earth, then the pen is something that's going to enable that vision along with the Surface device. So we are committed to pen and inking. Yesterday, you might have heard announcements on Spartan and a few other things that I will talk about shortly. Um, we are truly committed both from a hardware and software perspective to make our writing experiences great for our customers. Good. Who are our customers? Uh, a lot of times we travel, we meet people, uh, customers, partners, suppliers from around the world and some people ask, hey, who cares about writing anymore? We just type emails now. Um, but there are a few set of customers who still earn a living capture thoughts, create new ideas, and create imaginative stuff. Um, and those are people who work in offices. They take notes in meetings. Uh, students know, take notes. Uh, doctors are a huge category of people who walk around, take notes, write uh, notes about their patients. Artists and illustrators, we have a group of people who are constantly taking the pen, creating new pieces of art, whether it is with software created by um, third parties or whether it's created by us. There is a whole spectrum of people who are earning a living and making creative stuff, uh, artists and creators. And then, one of the most important categories we have is students and educators. Uh, I, how many educators, there, everybody are educators here? Okay. And how many of you use the Surface Pen? I forgot to ask that question. That is fantastic. Uh, I'd like to hear more uh, towards the end. Uh, but these, these are the set of audiences who are, who are, who are so important to us that we are constantly having a forum of these audiences and then we go talk to them on a constant basis, get feedback and find out what is relevant for them. How do we make the writing experience look great? Good, next. This is just a framework. It is not fully detailed. Uh, so as we talk about the session today, we, uh, I'll, I'll share some of the stuff, some of the stuff because of confidentiality, it'll be more, more at a higher level. But this is just to show you how we think about the framework of solving the problem. Um, there are several things that uh, impact the writing experience. There is latency, palm rejection, like identifying whether it's palm or your finger or your pen or something else that is touching the screen. Uh, eraser, when you erase, erase uh, a, a digital ink mark, how do you make it feel like an eraser and how do we solve that problem? Uh, storage, pen touch, ergonomics. So I just listed a few of them just to show you that these are some of the things that people care about. So a lot of times they are not able to articulate it but when they use it, we can see that it impacts their writing experience. And then, uh, depending on what they do with the pen, whether they are information workers, sometimes it's the same set of people. A person might be an information worker in the office, but an artist at home. So, but based on their usage scenarios, some of these factors are different um, in terms of amplitude, uh, in terms of impact, it's going to be different for each of those people. So, we, uh, we kind of look at uh, this and figure out what's most impactful, which audience, and how do we create a pen that addresses the concerns of all these, uh, all these people. Um, 
this is something I will stop and reflect, uh, students and teachers. This is, these are the key things that um, we found um, from our feedback from students and teachers. Um, people like to take notes, uh, very obvious, uh, signature, whether it's an application form, online application form, or um, PDFs, uh, navigating through tests, art, sketches, uh, playing games, uh, doodles during classes, um, and uh, sometimes annotation. So this is something I want to show you. Um, Okay, sorry. I will show you in the end. Um, I was trying to annotate on the PowerPoint. We can annotate on the PowerPoint. Nope. Okay, sorry about that failure, but um, when you use the PowerPoint, when you see using the PowerPoint on your machine, you can actually put it in um, present mode and uh... So as that's coming back, what, yeah. what Vineet's talking about is the scenario I think of is in a classroom where the teacher gives the material to the students beforehand so they don't have to uh, type everything down or write everything down with the, the hands and they're able to annotate a PowerPoint slide or, or a Word document or whatever they're given in real time. So a couple things with that. It makes, it frees them up to listen to the, what's being taught. I see some heads nodding here. And also that when you do that writing, that piece of writing it down connects it to the memory so you just remember it better later on too. So that to me is a really powerful classroom. Scenario with the pen. Yeah, and then thank you, Daryl. Thank you for uh, continuing the conversation. Um, so as you continue uh, your presentations, you can save them, save those annotations. Um, but then there are contexts of use. Uh, there are uh, devices that you operate your pen with. So pen is a complete uh, ecosystem in itself. How does the device? How do we influence the device while designing the pen? Then you have to find, define what the pen needs to be, and then. There is an external environment that people work in. You sit on a chair and try to use this. People sit on airplane seats and do it. So there is a context around usage. So we look at each of these factors and say, how do we solve the problem? Input detection, how do we find whether it's a finger or a palm or a pen? And there is a lot of algorithmic work that Dell and the operating system teams that they do to figure out what's the best way to find out whether it is a palm so that it doesn't react to it, whether it's a finger where you're trying to navigate, or a pen you're trying to write, or maybe tap something. Backward compatibility. This is, this is where I think a lot of times we say, hey, at what point do we leave behind the past? There is constant innovation happening in the industry. There is the heart, our heart says, yeah, we have sold so many products to our customers. If we change the platform, it's going to hurt them. How do we think about it? So this is a constant battle for every, uh, every uh, company in this industry because we're constantly looking at new technology. Uh, our goal is to make sure we don't, that we make it easy for our customers to transition. But there are times when we have to make drastic changes to move to a new technology because the trade-off in features and benefits that you get out of those are much higher than what you would get by just keeping sticking to what we have. So it's, it's a shift that we have to constantly battle with. When you write with a pen, uh, the other thing that comes to mind is uh, screen dependencies. There are different screen suppliers we have. So when you define, design a uh, Surface device, uh, there are suppliers like Samsung or LG or uh, Sharp. There are so many people supplying screens. And depending on the screen that you pick, your writing experience is going to be different because there's, there's coating, there's kind of glass that is used. All these things matter. Uh, screen protectors. A lot of people uh, buy screen protectors to protect their screen. And uh, there is absolutely no control that we have on what anybody can go and buy. So how do we how do we think about those challenges and how do we simulate some of those conditions to say, okay, uh, dif depending on the different friction levels that we have for screen protectors available or uh, simulating some of those friction levels, we, we go and try and uh, develop new chemicals, materials, and nibs uh, working with suppliers and partners. So. That's, uh, that's one. Uh, and just like I mentioned, um, screen dependencies, there is impact of dirt and dust and oil. Uh, when people use it, leave it in their cars for long periods of time, or um, kids use greasy hands, how do you make sure that the pen can still write? So uh, these are some fun challenges we get to work on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, this is one story I want to tell you, angle instability. So uh, when we use the pen uh, on the device, so this is where uh, some of the interaction between the pen and the device plays a big role in how we define our experiences on the device. Um, when we launched Surface Pro 2, um, we had a three-stop uh, hinge. I don't know how many of you have seen that. Um, at the end of Surface Pro, awesome. awesome. Yeah, you should, you should raise it and show it. Um, Surface Pro 2, it's a great machine. It's an absolutely great machine. We run, uh, a lot of our team members run Pro Engineer and like really advanced model software. I have software. still using this one. Awesome. <laughs> so, I should talk to you. Um, so when we talked to customers, the feedback was, hey, uh, so we looked, went to a whole spectrum of customers, the, the slide that we earlier saw, information workers, artists, students, and so on. And we said, hey, what's your most preferred position? And we were kind of um, observing them, and they were using the device. And uh, we gave them dummies, and they came back and said, uh, this position, this position, this position. And we couldn't find a statistically significant data on what's the right position to lock in. Is it three? Is it four? And then we said as a team, hey, what if you just made it continuous? continuous operation. Um, it is not an easy thing to do. I'm sure you see in current laptops, you have one hinge, full friction hinge, but the, but the challenge with the surface device is the center of gravity mm -hmm. is on the top, mm -hmm. unlike um, a, a traditional laptop, because the, the weight of the base helps you hold it. And this is a light, uh, a light uh, stand. So we had to design something that had a torque curve which gave us about 10 degrees free movement so that it's easy for anybody to just open it. And then, uh, I wish I could sketch somewhere, but uh, the torque curve went something like this. You, if, it, if the torque went on this axis and uh, um, the degrees, you had to go 10 degrees flat and then the curve had to go up and the curve would go down like that. So it's a, it's a really complicated thing to do. It took about uh, seven engineers, seven parts, um, seven, seven months of uh, effort on this um, across, like, literally the supply chain for this hinge is across China. Um, so it is such a complicated work uh, to make it happen. Uh, so the, the funny thing is, when you start writing on this, uh, at this angle, it is totally fine. But when you actually take it uh, backwards, you want to make sure that the torque is high enough to hold the weight as well as the writing pressure. And the writing pressure changes as you change the angle. So it's, it's a super fun project that we had to go uh, solve. Finally, this is how, uh, of course, many of you have it, uh, but those of you who don't have it, this is a video that I wanted to play. And these are all the angles at which we tested the pen and how it works and how, how we wanted to make sure it can kind of beautif beautifully withhold the pressure of writing. The next one is, so we talk about the device, how we, uh, there is a close interaction between the device and the pen. And now we talk about what are the different functions. When we design a pen, there is a question, are we design, is this a digital pen? Should it make it a traditional pen, just like Pilot, Mont Blanc, or anything else? Or what else can we add to this? Um, is there memory we can add? Can we write? Can we, is the, the one, when you're using the pen, should the pen be a mouse? Or, or should we have to both of them? And how do you think about the interaction paradigm? So that's a question we constantly answer, uh, try to answer and figure out whether it's a mouse or a pen. And if it's a pen, if it does just does writing, or what features can we add? And then one of the things that we ended up adding uh, as a team is uh, the one known feature that Daryl will talk about. That's fascinating innovation, how we thought about it. Location, uh, airplane seats. I remember when we were doing the hinge test, um, one of the things I told the team is, hey, we should be able to sit on an airplane seat in economic class and should be able to operate the hinge and ride on it. So I actually called a friend of mine, Boeing, he's a technical fellow, he shipped us six seats. And every time we had prototypes made, we sat on that as a team and figured out, okay, does it work? If it fails, we go back to the drawing board and kind of tweak the top levels. So uh, it was a fun experiment. But this just goes to show how much we are committed to uh, hearing from our customers, understanding their pain, and kind of addressing them. Uh, power consumption. Um, how do we decide whether it's a rechargeable battery versus a um, quad A or a um, AAA battery? Uh, so there is a lot of functions. So there is a writing experience. There is a Bluetooth module that, uh, that I will talk about shortly. Um, in the pen, 
So there are a lot of functions in the pen that draw power. At a certain point, we need to figure out when do we start moving to a rechargeable battery. And there is a constant trade-off. There are benefits of rechargeability because a rechargeable battery not only gives us the ability to recharge and not having the customer uh, insert um, or buy a new battery all the time, uh, but it also gives us the ability to make the pen thinner. For example, if you see some Samsung pens, they're really thin, they're rechargeable, they can dock inside this uh, dock inside the device. But one, one thing that was true not for us was uh, we are designing a pen for great writing experience. Not for great storage, but great writing experience. We wanted to make sure artists and illustrators can hold the pen for four or five hours in a day and not be kind of tired. So ergonomics was very fundamental to our design, uh, design idea. Sorry. Uh, so the diameter of our pen is 9.1 millimeters and the, the right range, ergonomic range, is between 8.5 to about 10.5. So uh, we had to play between the right range and make sure that the uh, holding comfort is great. The other question is, now that we are not making the pen thinner, how do you store? Uh, of course, we, we had the clip that you can, you can actually store the pen. Uh, or you can, uh, or should we be able to dock it? And we decided to go with the clip because, it, um, as as I said, if you are trying to create a natural user interface, you're saying a hey, pen is something that somebody carries personally, and uh, carries just like a pen. Um, there are other funny things that happen as a part of the exercise. Uh, reliability is one one such thing. Now, um, when we define design the tip, uh, how do we design how long the tip should last? Um, it's, it's a very difficult question, and people use it, uh, some people use it once in a week, some people never use it, and some people use it every day for hours together. So we have to find the right curve in terms of usage patterns and find out how do we get to, you know, ideal would be close to Six Sigma, but where does the business trade-off happen? Or should we ship them separate tips, or uh, you know, how, do we, how do we design that? That's, that's another challenge that we face, uh, and our tips uh, currently in the market are doing really well. Uh, we, we had some tips. Uh, which were softer, uh, but we replaced with more, more longer lasting tips. And that's that's a question we constantly ask. How do we make sure the writing experience is great and it lasts longer? Because the more the friction, the less of the life. The more it's going to kind of wear off. So that's the problem we get solved. Uh, clip strength, the drop, screen impact, how do you make sure people, if they're hitting, they don't break the screen? So these these are some of the challenges. And in the end, if you have specific questions, we can, we can answer those. Next one. Yeah, and then we do a lot of innovation in software, and that's where Daryl, my friend, is going to talk to you about it. So my turn. I'm Daryl Wilson, and uh, to give you an idea of what I do is I'm a software and firmware PM in the Surface Group, and I work on both pen and touch. And so what that that means to me is we want to make pen and touch the experience that that will make people put away the MacBook like you had. <laughs> so I do want to ask you, do you have a Surface Pro? Well, I very much have a Surface. My only problem, if you want me to be completely honest, yep. is I have a big gut, and with the hinge on the back, mm -hmm. it doesn't fit on my lap. Gotcha. That's, so when you, when you use your Mac, do you ever try and touch the screen? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's that's a problem. I, I very much prefer my Surface, to be honest with you. It's yeah. just when there's no cable. Yeah. My legs are too short, yeah. too. <laughs> That's, that's, that's my only complaint. I'd much rather be. I get under the hand or anything some more. But, but I, I very much. We've, we've heard those complaints, and um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say that much. So, so yeah, I, you know. yeah, great. But so my point with that is, I one of my sons has a Mac. I didn't buy it. And, um, oftentimes, when we sit down to go to work together on it, I'll touch the screen, and, I, and I'm like, oh, there you go, dude, you can't use this, you need surface. So, um, I know for me, uh, using touch and pen all the time is just automatic now, and I, I need that interaction to make more productive. So, uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is, is our, our technologies and some of our features. So, as we went from Surface Pro 2 and had ideas for Surface Pro 3, we were thinking, what, can, what scenarios can we expand upon it? and make this a super valuable product. And one of them was the click with the pen. And who, hands up, anyone who's used the click with the pen? A little bit. Good. Seen it on commercials? All right, so a little bit familiar with it. I, I prefer an eraser. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I prefer They're the racer too. Yeah, the racer is much better. We've heard that feedback too. So, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll continue Some on Some of here. us fidget too much for that clicker. Because <laughs> <laughs> my better. window's opening constantly. <laughs> it's so fun to fidget with too. Right. Uh, so we, to incorporate this experience, uh, to we used our Bluetooth technology in the pen, so it has a active digitizer on one side and Bluetooth on the other side to enable scenarios. And so what we wanted to build was um, for someone to have a thought and instantly be able to click that button, either so you're not logged in or when you're logged in, and instantly create, take that thought down. So you think of a notebook. What, what do you have to do to take a note in a notebook? You open your notebook, you click your pen, you start writing. So that's the type of experience that we wanted to also get with the Surface Pro 3. Um, as we continue on, we get feedback like you just mentioned, and we'll continue to improve the experience. So there's, there's good things coming. Uh, we can't talk about all the stuff we're gonna do, but there's definitely good things coming. So with uh, the collaboration with OneNote and Windows, it was a, it was a great cross-company effort. Um, it wasn't very easy to do, but it was a, we were very happy with the feature. And we continue to work with our partners in Windows and, um, and Office to, to continue making great experiences. Um, so when, also, when you think of pen, it's not just pen, it's touch too. So when you put your hand on the screen, you have to make sure that we know the pen is touching and it, that you don't want to, you're not using your fingers. So part of that is palm rejection. Uh, we work with our partner in, in Israel, Entry, and also with Intel, and we, with OSG, which is our Windows partners, and we continue to improve that experience and, and figure out when you're touching it with your palm and when you're writing, and to make sure that's a seamless experience. So there's good stuff going on in, in Threshold for that. Another item in, that's um, coming in Threshold is Direct Ink. So does, did anyone see the build presentations yesterday? No? So one of the things they had in the build was um, a new browser called Spartan, which is, I think the official name is Edge. But one of the great features in that is that is ink. they're using Direct Ink in Spartan Edge. Um, and what that allows you to do is to have a consistent platform across Windows that you can ink in different applications and share that ink. So in, in uh, Spartan, you can annotate with pen and you can change, you can convert that to text. You save that in that web page. So you save it as a favorite, you go back to that web page and it has your annotations and your notes there. And you can share it off to different applications too. You can send that to a friend. Um, the great thing about the Direct Ink is it's a platform that allows different application developers to use that platform to quickly have inking in their, in their app that's consistent across different apps. So before, people would have to roll their own, they'd have to come up with their own um, ideas on how to put menus up there, how to get different colors and highlighters, etc. Now that that's built into Windows, and um, we know that the success of an operating system is how many people develop on it. We saw Apple do fantastic with their, their phones and their iPads because it was a great application development platform. And this is what Windows continues to drive to and is succeeding in, is in enabling these different scenarios. Um, pressure curves, so also considering how different people use the pen so artists maybe want a different pressure curve. You might not be aware, but with the, um, our Surface Pro 3 pen, it's uh, pressure sensitive. So if you touch it lightly, you get a thin line. You press hard, the line thickens. So this enables different people like artists using Adobe, or if you're taking notes, is to control the way that um, how hard you press, what happens as your ink comes out. Got a peek around the corner. Um, so third-party applications, I talked about those a little bit on what's to come, but also we work with third-party app um, developers directly. Some people will, we initiate um, planning and roadmaps so that as we roll out features, they're, they're provided a heads up and we develop those together. And some we see an opportunity where an application is trying to do something and we say, hey, we've got this technology and APIs, we think you can do it quicker and better. 
and we directly contact them and work with, work with them. Um, office and Windows. So I touched on that a little bit. Um, I'm a little bit biased, but we've got some good stuff coming this year, and I'm really excited about it. Most nights I pull my hair out about it, but I'm really <laughs> looking forward to it. Uh, so, of course, it's part of things we can't talk about, there, but there's some good stuff coming. Um, and, and it really depends on collaboration uh, with our Windows partners, with our entry who does our, our touch platform, um, and Intel. Intel's a big part of it as well. So there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, this year's bit off a lot, but it's going to be fantastic when it uh, all comes public. Right. Kind of back to you. Thank you. Yeah, our teams are very closely tied at the head. Um, Daryl's team taking care of all the software side, uh, my team taking care of all the hardware side, but we are really not different teams, we're just this one team working together across Microsoft. So that's that's an exciting thing. Uh, from software, we just shift to a little bit more physics. Uh, physics at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, <laughs> we will still do it. So, when we think about function, um, we think about what we talk about. What does the bench do? Uh, the fundamental thing is the bench is right. And when we say, how do we create natural writing experiences? What's a natural user experience? How do you break it down? So when people write, there are three things. I mean, among other things like lighting and kind of paper and pen and everything, among other things, there are three things that really happen. One, when you touch the pen or pencil to the paper, you get a certain amount of friction. And then you get a tactile feel on your hand. And then there is a sound associated with that friction. These three things constitute fundamentally in terms of like getting the right experience into your brain. So that's why a lot of times when you write with digital pens, you don't feel like you're writing or you're slipping. So over like time, since time immemorial, that's been ingrained into our DNAs. And that's something we are kind of trying to solve. How do we, how do we create that experience in a digital world uh, as opposed to an analog world. So there is a lot of work that, that we do in terms of optimizing the software, optimizing the pressure curves that Daryl talked about, how do we get the right chemicals, um, chemical ingredients in the uh, in the tip so that when it rubs against glass, how do you get that feel? So that's, those are some really cool investments that we do. Uh, tip friction we just talked about briefly, which is when the friction is higher, the life is shorter. And how do you make sure what's the trade-off? How do you make sure the customer is not pained by not having a tip when he, when he or she really needs it? Uh, parallax is another interesting concept. When you write pen on paper, you really touch the surface. When you write with a digital pen, uh, um, what happens is there are three layers. So there is a uh, glass layer, there is a digitizer layer. If you have a screen protector, there is another one. And then there is um, uh, the layer where the capacitive layer with pen functions, right? So there's a digitizer below. So if you look at the stack up, it can, it can vary from a few millimeters, a uh, few microns to a few millimeters, and depending on what solutions you pick. So when, when what happens is when you touch your uh, pen, your before you touch the digitizer, you already touch the glass. So your pen is above your actual touch surface by a millimeter or so. And then when you look at it, the eye gets deceived. Am I touching, where am I touching? It is very confusing. It's like, the, like looking at a fish through the water in the lake. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you're looking at. that's a good example. So how do you solve that problem? We can make the glass thinner, that makes the life of the device poor. If you, um, if you solve the parallax, then whether you should project the dot straight here or you project the dot perpendicular here. How do, you, how do you solve that? And there's a lot of algorithmic stuff that we do in the entry chip that we ship today to make that absolutely minimal as possible. So there is, uh, that is something that adds to the accuracy as well. Uh, accurate, yeah, accuracy we talked about. Again, uh, where you touch, is it exactly where you see that it touches? So there is, uh, there is accuracy because what happens is in a, in a capacitive, um, we, we talk about that in the platform a little bit, but in the capacitive, what happens is there are transparent line conductive lines. Uh, there is a hash. And then when the pen comes closer to it, the hash actually acts like antenna, and the pen is like a radio. So it picks up the closest dot, and it depends on the refinement of those uh, transparent conductive lines or antennas that have that is in the digitizer, that you can get absolutely precise dots. So it's, uh, there is communication happening in these two, just like radio communication. 
and then you have to find the precise dot as you're writing. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing to solve. Um, so we spend a lot of energy on making sure that when you touch the pen, it actually touches where you intended to touch. Uh, platform, there's a lot of questions that we get on platform. There, is, there are really credible players in the market. There is Qualcomm, there is Atmel, there is uh, Entrick, uh, there is Donut. There's so, so many players in the market. And, uh, each of them are great solutions. Uh, they are all picked based on uh, there are business decisions, there are technical constraints that each of us, uh, uh, each of these companies try to solve. Um, fundamentally, there are three kinds of um, um, technologies. One is electromagnetic. Uh, in the electromagnetic, what happens is you have the um, screen um, display, and then below that you have uh, kind of planar coils. It's like, think of it like a transformer. So one end of the transformer is below in, in the form of planar coils, and then the other end of the um, transformer, an additional set of coils, is in the pen. So as the pen approaches within about 15 millimeters, it can identify electromagnetic signals, and that's how the pen kind of calibrates where it is reaching out and then identifies the dots. That's electromagnetic. And there is passive. I think it's like fake finger. Um, some, of the, some of the pens that you see, uh, it's, it's like fake finger. Yeah, so basically you use the same touch technology, but uh, kind of fake the material uh, to make it feel like you, you're actually touching your finger. And the third one is active capacity, which is what we use. That is the entry technology. So in Surface Pro 2, we had Wacom, which is the electromagnetic, and then we decided to move to active capacity, purely because it gives us better latency uh, and better performance uh, in, the, in the scenarios that we operate and we care about. Uh, Wacom operates in, uh, with uh, some specific audiences. It's great for them. So it's purely based on what works for us. Each of them are great technologies in themselves. So that's how uh, we pitch. So the active yes, capacity. The Surface Pro 2 was Wacom? Yes, that is correct. The one that uh, she's using is, doesn't have battery. I would have to think you were looking towards the future because that entry pen is going to give you that ability with the battery in it to do more of the gesturing that you want to do with pens long term. That yes. this so, pen is not going to probably be able to do without a battery in it. Yeah, so battery enables right. you to open up a new set of scenarios that, because yeah. you have power. And with power and Bluetooth, you can open up a whole new set of scenarios. There is a lot of innovation work that is going to come up in the next generation of pens. The teams are constantly working on it. I'll be killed if I talk about it, so we'll <laughs> stop it. I think we talked about accelerometers, so that, that cat's out of the bag. Well, the potential, the potential for accelerometers. I don't know who talked about it. Or the potential <laughs> for sensors around the outside of the pen was talked about. The other so you can see yes. which way it's being so there is. There is a lot of stuff. Yeah, it can have accelerometers, and GPS, and everything. Yes, potentially. I'm not my, saying we do it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that those are the those are the things that we think about. Um, so what did we finally build? This is just a kind of um, explorer view of the pen, just so you know what are the different components that go in. Um, there are about 170 different components that go into the pen. Uh, it's amazing, uh, and all into this little size. So just like Daryl mentioned, we we had a front pen, which is what does the writing and the erase functions with the button, and then we have a back pen, which does the Bluetooth, which does communication with the uh, OS, and enables one node and other capabilities. Uh, a couple years ago, too, when they, they said, oh, I'll be working on the pen on the firmware part of the Bluetooth, I thought, ah, that's easy, we'll get it done in a month or so. That was not the case. You have to think about it from end to end from manufacturability, um, servicing, and customer first use through through battery life. So it's uh, even a tiny little thing like a pen, it's, it's pretty complex. I and mean, it takes a lot of people thinking about a lot of scenarios to, to deliver it. So it's yeah. complicated. It's a very complex ecosystem. <laughs> so where are customers using it? Um, hopefully my video works. Materials, uh, recordings, everything, and this is a 
uh, cross section of the pen just for you to see, just in case you have just one person's side. So, can you take a picture of that to show sure. with our engineers so they can Absolutely. see it? Absolutely. <laughs> so on behalf of Dale, let me thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Um, so the Nikki Nikki and the OS level, is that going to be uh, integrated into modern apps? I'm not sure if they're called modern apps anymore. Can you be a bit more specific on what's, what sort of things you're thinking about? In so I am um, a PG student, I'm developing a modern app currently in Windows 8.1. And um, I'm looking into the possibility of integrating the more standard way of inking on the uh, on the application, and I'm interested in learning what kinds of uh, data I can actually gather from that ink, yeah. such as loca uh, location pressure data, hover data, that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, I I don't know the answer to that question. If you send me an email, I'm on the bottom list there. I'll All right. follow up for you. But uh, specifically, the direct ink platform is available for. For uh, modern apps. Okay. In, in this term. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm Don from uh, Cornell. Since it's recording, it's being recorded, sure. so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Don Yun from Cornell, I'm a PhD student. And as usual, uh, here's an episode that I was developing a Touch Plus Pen application on Windows Tablet. And, uh, you know, obviously, because of the palm rejection, it doesn't uh, recognize my touch and pens on hover. So I should get down to the OS level to hack the signal and then re uh, reverse engineer the signal and you know, uh, extract out the signals uh, back to touch plus pen. So it, it does not, it, it, uh, my point here is the pen interaction itself is not only about the pen but also about the OS level. But also the application is involved such as uh, the, the uh, my favorite feature of the surface is that when you push the button and the uh, will not come out, uh, then um, what I reconcile about this is that it, uh, it requires a cross departmental uh, um, coordination of those interplay or tension uh, tension management. So I want to hear how you guys are doing it. And sure, I, I can talk about it from a little bit hardware perspective. Yeah. Jumping down from software. Um, you're right, the pen is an ecosystem in itself. So, for example, let's look at latency. Um, latency is a function of what happens in the pen, what happens to the digitizer, and how much the application is tuned. For example, one note is the most, uh, most beautifully tuned uh, for latency we have today. So we, we have to do it at all those levels. And I don't know for the operating system you have used Windows 10 or you using Windows uh, 8.1? 8. .1? 8. So uh, hopefully with Windows 10 and the inking uh, investments that we're making, there should be some difference. Can't talk about it. <laughs> 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 the, yeah, so you'll hopefully be happier, but I can't uh, speak of specifics. <laughs> we have to wait for some more time to talk about that. Thanks. But uh, we've heard that feedback. Yeah, a lot of work is happening in, in that space. So Absolutely. <laughs> when Windows 10 is released. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm a PM on the uh, Ingo platform team. Okay. So just just to clarify, um, so you, uh, what are you like? Are you asking for both pen and touch together? Or I, I I couldn't follow. So my question was about how the pen team is dealing with the interplay or tension uh, between the other department or dealing with OS or application. Oh, it's a cross-group cross collaboration question. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, I don't know you, but um, <laughs> that's good. Uh, we are a big company, uh, 130,000 people. Independent of that, we are constantly working closely with Office team, with the OneNote team, uh, with the operating system team, with the Bing team, everybody. So every week, I think, from a software perspective, there's constant reviews in terms of what hardware investment making, how does it impact the software, how does it impact the applications. So the teams are crossing paths all the time, and we have a regular rhythm of reviews to make sure when the customer gets an experience, it's, it's a kind of connected experience. And a lot of times, like it is not easy uh, when you uh, acquire a company like Nokia. Your technology is completely new, and at certain points in time, you have to make a business decision: uh, for the sake of integrating, should we do it, or should we make it uh, so that it's it's a great customer experience? So that, there's a constant trade-off that happens. Yeah, and. and we are kind of the common denominator, so we work with Surface, we work with the Surface Hub, so 
there are certain things that can be ported over, certain things that cannot really work really well on surface, but really works well on the surface hub. So it's a it's a trade off, and th there is, th like he said, it's a big company. There are constant uh, feedback going in and out. So yeah. things but uh, no doubt we are one company. Uh, it just takes time to schedule people and meet, meet with each other, but that's the thing. Right. We we operate like one company. Thank you for jumping. We have another question here. Okay, just as a point of clarification, um, so the inking overlay is it strictly going to be in the Edge browser, or is that going to be operating system wide? The platform is available operating system wide for applications that support it, so they have the ability to call those platform APIs. And I think you're probably the expert on that; they can speak to it. Uh, but in, in Spartan, that's that's a specific app that uses that platform. So, um, as you mentioned, the direct ink is. API set. So any application you could create a universal Windows app uh, and call in those APIs, and you, you could do it. It's it's it's, it's open. Uh, okay. Since one of the most important um, ergonomic uh, features from users' point of view is being able to write in a more small, precise manner mm -hmm. that they think reflects their radio sure. paper. Yeah. What do you think the most important factors are in terms of the hardware and software, not hardware primarily, sure. um, to try to support rating in a smaller and a more precise way? Yeah. And in your own evaluations, how far off is the size of writing comparable content on a tablet versus the paper? Sure. So definitely, it's a great question. If you write on one note today, or let's say if you write uh, an email with handwriting, if you try to write with a pen, the text is usually larger. And it's a combination of what happened with pen and largely on the software side. So we're constantly working on it. I can't tell you how far we, if, from from an experience perspective, we are we are far from where we should be. But how we are, far we are from solving it, I can't tell you that. But we are working on it. As teams, we're working on it to make sure when you write, you can kind of calibrate the size and the font to what you're writing. Because I, I understand what your question is, which is when you write, you feel like, hey, why am I writing so big? And so if I'm writing on paper, I write small. Yeah, we, we constantly work on it. So I, I have a couple of comments. Pen sure. yeah. friction. That's what I think of when you want to write, how you write on paper, yeah. is having the pen friction on the screen being as close as possible to pen on paper. So for me, that's part of it. The other piece is palm rejection, too. Um, if, if people are afraid that if they, they put their palm down or rest on it, and they, they hover, and they try and write when they hover, <coughs> the writing's going to be different. So the, the better we make the palm rejection, as customers get used to understanding that I can put my hand down and write how I would put my hand down on a piece of paper, that'll get it closer to a pen on paper experience. Yeah. Another quick question I have was just um, if you're doing any longitudinal studies looking at the ergonomics of the pen and minimization of repetitive stress <coughs> in terms of different pen ergonomics or the friction or other issues, I'm also interested in that. So. Sure, yeah, we, we have not, uh, to be honest, we have not done repetitive stress on that, uh, stress studies on how using uh, pen. Um, a company, I don't know if somebody's doing it, but I'd love to know. But uh, this is some. So right now, our our goal is to make sure that pen can write beautifully, write um, uh, write like natural writing experience, so that there's more adoption. Uh, if it's Surface Pro 3, we've seen a huge uptick in pen usage. Uh, once we see that usage, now we start. Well, the next step will be we can start measuring how people are using it and what what the stress levels are. So it's there is a curve that we need to kind of pass to get to that level. Unfortunately, my question comments more of an account question than a, than a hardware question. Uh, but I'm a, de a director of technology for a K through 12 school, and our, some of our teachers are using Surface Pro 3s. And I thought the clicking the button, going right to OneNote, you know, even if your the computer's locked, was a really neat feature. It requires having a Microsoft account, though. So doing that for students, especially students under 13, sure. is a little bit difficult. Yep. From our perspective, if there was a way around that, or if it required an Office 365 account instead of a um, instead of a Microsoft account. That'd be really good for us. 
Sure. Yeah. We take that feedback. Can you send me an email? And can I yeah. also respond to that? You can actually change the default to open up the desktop version of OneNote. I did not know that. Yeah. That was actually my second question. Does it require a Microsoft account? Okay, that's good to know. Where does it give you opportunity? That control panel? Yes, and if you download, we have actually, actually a Surface app. Actually, there's a Surface app. app. Surface app is, yeah, there's a the Surface app that you need to get, and that gives you, you can customize the pen, and you can customize your ink curve, and everything is very cool. It's just on the, on the store. Just just one quick note on that. The name's changed to yes. Surface app because yeah. we have because something else. Surface surface not here now. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, go to the store, search on Surface app, and it's exactly there. So, so I find the palm rejection problem so annoying, what I would really love to do is be able to quickly turn touch off entirely and turn it back on again later. And it's amazingly hard to do. I've seen registry hacks for doing it, but I've not seen a sort of like civilized... So it's my job that you don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm hoping you succeed. If I'm still working here in September, October, then I hope they succeeded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if not, they'll send me there. Right. But, but seriously, um, great feedback. Do you have, do you find that you hit the Windows button at all? Or do you oh, find yeah. it just mm -hmm. yeah. Constantly. The, the Windows button, any app over here, when I hold the pin, yes, that's fine. But when I'm thinking, I often do this, and then whatever's First under here gets hit. It. Yeah, right. Uh, the 13-year-old Wacom pen still works fine uh, from an Acer. Yeah. So, okay. so, so one thing over there is, uh, so generally when, when pen comes in touch with surface, uh, pen takes over, touches, oh, yeah. is killed. So when you hold your pen off in your finger, you're, you're above what is called the hover height. And so, oh, yeah. I know, I know why it happens. But the point is that it's, when you're thinking, you don't really want to be thinking, I constantly have to keep my pen down here, right? It's, it's distracting. I, uh, like like Lenny says, I can't uh, divulge much, but we know we get aware of it, we're working on it, but yeah. hopefully later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you for the but, feedback. But for any of this feedback, I really would like some, I think Vanita as well, add us, send an email to both of us. Um, can't promise that we'll specifically address what's going on, but this is a great forum to hear all your everybody's feedback of, of what challenges you face. And I also hear like to hear what you like too. That'd be great. <laughs> I was just going to comment on that too because you're looking why am I using a Surface Pro 2, and that's exactly the reason. I, I need my pen to write when I want to write, and I don't want to have to sleep. I don't want to have to worry about the battery dying. I don't want to have to worry about it me clicking when I don't mean to click. And I, I take all my notes in one note. I've been doing this for you know. I don't know how many years now, 10? I don't know, a long time. I don't know when OneNote came out. It's been a long time. And when I switched to Surface Pro 3, the pen wasn't as reliable as my Wacom pen is. And I wound up switching back. I got frustrated with it. And just I went through three pens. And I went back to my, my reliable Wacom. Because if you look at my pen, I'm on a Surface. This isn't a Surface pen. It's a, a Samsung pen. And I was able to change my nib out because I didn't like the nibs that came with the with the pens, they were too hard for me, and I like softer nibs, so I wanted a pen I could change my nib in, too. Okay. So. It's true. My two colleagues who have Surface Pro 3s both have problems with their pens. And, for instance, my wife has two pens, and there's she gets in situations where neither of them work. And it's really weird. It's like the batteries are fine, everything's fine. That's his butt on mine. <laughs> 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 Stop writing. So, uh, yeah. If I'm, if I'm looking good in September, both of them. No, that's saying you might have. I wanted to ask a kind of follow up on the, on the nib. Um, as far as the nibs go, you spoke about a spectrum of users, right? You know, some are casual and some yep. just may use it periodically. In that case, it'll last forever. Yep. And then there's that other side of the spectrum with artists and illustrators where it may wear down yep. really quickly. And sure. So, how did you find that compromise and of, you know, I guess kind of finding some kind of middle ground. Sure. And then do you see a, a future where uh, there might be interchangeable tips? And, and Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, the future is where we, we will have options for tips or we will think about um, getting that spectrum even better than what we have today. Um, there's a lot of work that's going on in terms of finding the right material. Um, yeah, I, I can talk more about it, but we are committed to getting that right. 
Uh, right now, uh, the, the friction is slightly lower because we want to have the uh, tip last longer. As you can see, uh, earlier we launched with a softer tip, which was great in terms of writing experience, but people, people gave us feedback, hey, that it's way more faster, we'd like to have, we'd like to see that different, and based on the, and the volume of feedback, we, we went and fixed that.